So today we're going to talk about secrets of manufacturers agents. I'm Bernie Martin with Rapid Production Marketing and one of the things that I've heard over the course of my career is that reps don't work and when I was vice president of marketing one of the big problems that I had was I can't find a good rep and when I was in distributor sales I kind of looked at it and said well some of these reps just collect a check. Some of them are really good. When I was a manufacturer's agent, I heard quite often, I just don't understand reps, both from the distributor and from the manufacturer's side. And as president of an industrial distributor, I can tell you that there are some reps that literally just don't work. But generally, reps work. So our agenda for today is multifold. We're going to cover what reps look for in a line. We're going to take this from the rep perspective. We're going to also cover in the big picture the industrial buying cycle. And we're going to finish up with how to find them and find you. And just to go into some detail on these things. We're going to look we're going to look at quality, we're going to look at competitiveness, we're going to look at service, we're going to look at availability, marketing support, and trust. And those six things are what make the gears work, what make the cylinders turn, which make them all hit at the same time so the timing is right in your efforts to find reps. And then we're going to jump again to the industrial buying cycle and go into some general perceptions about what's out there, how different generations look at things. We're going to take a look at some communication tools in depth. Then we're going to bring it all kind of back together into the marketing support area which really is helping them, finding them, them finding you. So what do reps look for? So we've got the, the nice spy glass here up in the right, so let's find out what to look for. The first thing they're looking for is, is it a quality product? Is it priced correctly? How is customer support? What are the stock levels or delivery? Delivery becomes a key point. We're going to cover that in some detail. And then what's the commission? Obviously, how much are they going to get paid? <clears throat> the big thing, and you notice this third on the list here, is what kind of marketing materials are available? That becomes a big issue today with a lot of changes that are happening right now and how communications happen. So that spyglass from before, there's some technology that's added to it, and this is the kind of technology changes that we're talking about now. Oh, and the final thing we're going to talk about, the thread that runs through everything, is can I trust them? Meaning the rep is saying, can I trust you? So the first thing that we need to really look at, and this is the first thing that your reps are going to look at, is the price versus quality ratios. So is it priced competitively? And we all understand that there's an elasticity of demand and where your price point should be, and there's some details within that. Can I sell it on the market? as a performance product or as a commodity product. So the price to performance ratio, where's your competitors at? Where's the discount levels at? What's the discount out here for stocking if you have products that can be stocked out in the field? Um, all these are issues and where you're at and where margins are at are really important. So more important question that a rep's going to have is does it fit in my market? Is it good for my area? Does this fit in my product mix? Big question that a lot, th those are pretty common questions. One of the big questions that a lot of people miss is, does it have walk away reliability? And this is something that's, that reps are gonna be thinking about. And what I mean by walk away, walk away reliability is this. Are there persistent problems that are gonna require my time and my service? We're gonna come back to a lot to time because you gotta keep time in the back of your head. Remember that old English rhyme that said, for one of a nail, the shoe was lost. For one of the shoe, the horse was lost. Done on until, you know, all for the one of a horseshoe nail. Well, in some cases, sometimes the devil's really in the details. And so you may have a screw that's not included. So they have to find that screw. And then the customer calls up the rep and they have to figure out where one screw is located. In the meantime, and this is the way it walk away reliability part, the rep is your eyes and ears out here in the field. So if they're telling you that your competitor not only supplies the two screws, but they supply the Torx driver with it, that's a problem for them. That's a walk away reliability problem. 
So it's really in the details of this. They're your eyes and ears. You've got to listen to what they're asking and find out why they're asking it. And remember, time is money. It's a, it's a balance for a rep. And we're going to talk about this a lot. And I can't hammer home that enough. The next item that they're going to ask about is customer support. So when they ring you up on the phone, how many rings till they get an answer? Because remember, they're calling you up from the road. They live on the road. Their office is in their vehicle. They're traveling. And that means they don't want to talk to a robot. They don't want to punch in numbers. They want to get somebody on the phone, and they expect that from your customer. So your first part of your reputation is how well can they get in, how quick can they get answered. When they get to somebody, how well trained are your customer service reps and your field support staff in the field? Can they answer the questions, or do they have to wait for answers? <laughs> Will they, when they call them at night because they're driving, can they technically support them on the phone in the evening? Especially if you're dealing across the coast, if you're dealing across the country or around the world, which time zone are you in? How long does it take to get an answer? So think about this. I, I, having been a rep, I'm in an account. I need an answer. I need to get something. Can you answer that on the phone for me? Okay, you'll call me back. I put the phone down. I drive 20 minutes to the next appointment. I get a phone call 20 minutes in, said, drive 20 minutes back, here's the answer. That just took 40 minutes out of my day. I got another 20 minutes answering the question that I could have done there. I got an hour and a half blown. I missed the next appointment. That's cost me money as a rep. So think about their time and how valuable it is. Remember, time is money. And how it's perceived out there is the most important aspect of this. So if they call on the phone or they think you're using a rotary phone, even if you're not, that's the perception, that's a problem. They want you to be wired in. They want you to have cell phones. They want you to have iPads. They want you to be able to access the information however the customer wants to supply it. So technically savvy people should have, companies need to have the tools internally to meet this demand. So, next big question. If I sell it, is it available? Availability is an issue. Is it in stock if it's a stock product and a catalog item? How accurate is the delivery time? If this is an order for delivery, how accurate is that time? Because if it's not an accurate time and you miss that deadline or it's not in stock and you have three pieces out of a 30 piece order, and we're talking about manufacturing here, so there's three pieces out of a 30 piece order. For them to ship, they need all 30 pieces. Somebody from either your channel partner or the distributor, if you do that way, or the customer is going to be making this rep's phone ring a lot. Every day on the hour, can you check delivery for me again? Can you check delivery for me again? And you start missing dates, that's the time money equation. That's where the balance is because this is opportunity cost in economic terms. So back in econ in college, you talked about opportunity costs. For every minute they're spending handling this problem is a minute they're not selling your product. It's good to keep in mind. So also, what's your capacity? What happens if I sell a lot? Can you scale up with me? I was importing hot sauce from Jamaica many years ago. I got a huge deal. I mean, this is Defense Logistics Agency, MREs. How do I quote it? How do we make it? Couldn't make more than 800 gallons a month. Can't supply 3 million MREs. These are the types of things that they're going to ask and they want to be concerned about. So remember, if it starts to take more time, that's a problem because that gets them further away from the ground making money. And now comes the money part because this is a concern for reps, but it's not always what you think. So you're going to talk about commission, and commission is very important. So they're going to ask you who else has the line. And they're going to ask you, do you sell direct? That's an issue if, if they have channel partners. In some cases, in some cases not. They're going to ask you, is there a shared territory? And this is the stuff you're going to hear. But the reality is, there's some real questions in the back end. Not that these aren't real questions, but who else has the line? I'm going to call them up, but how do you pay your bills? They're going to want to know how you pay your bills. Because they have to get paid. So what's the term of the contract? So is it a 30 days? Is it 60 days after one year? What's termination look like? 
What they're asking you in that contract with regard to this money part, are you a long-term partner for my business? They're a business, they want to have partners, are you a long-term partner for this? And you've got to understand what that real question is. So when do I get paid? Um, and this is, you know, do I, do I get credit on existing business? That's what you may hear. Oh, they're just kind of looking for this existing business stuff. When in actuality, they want to know, do I get paid on time every month? Are you going to pay me every day at the same, every month at the same time and treat my company just like you would any other bill? Or am I the afterthought? And then how much do I get paid? So again, you're thinking, oh, this is all about money. And it is about money, because they need to live. Is it 5%, 8%, 10%, 15%? It depends on where your brand is at. If it's an existing brand, yeah, you can get away with less. But your, your, your commission rate to your reps, and again, if you have another layer of channel, that, that, you know, it's a dealer or distributor, you have to adjust that so it's scalable. You want their time, you're going to have to come up in commission. At that high end, it's a 15% to the rep because you're going to need to buy his or her time. And then they're looking at it this whole time, is it worth my time? That's what the real question is on that one. How do I get paid? So we've covered who, what, when, where, how, and how again. And they're saying, hey, are you going to direct deposit it? Or are you going to send me a check? Because if I'm on the East Coast and you're on the West Coast, it's going to take seven days and then it has to clear the bank. I've got to wait for my money. And if your person isn't putting into the mail in time, that's going to slow me down getting payment. But there's another real question here. I'm a multi-person rep agency. Are your reports useful? Are you supplying me reports that I can split up between and pay commission to my people? How do I break that out? Knowing what your reports look like can be a real pain in the butt when you spend three days trying to sort through what it is. And remember, opportunity cost, if I'm going through your reports, I'm not selling. I'm doing paperwork, I'm not making money. The key overriding to all of these real questions is trust. So can I trust you? It's gonna develop over years, you're gonna have a relationship, you've gotta trust each other. Now we're gonna skip back to the industrial buying cycle. We're gonna move over to there, and this kind of talks a little bit about marketing. Marketing. So part of the problem that we have, and not a lot of people recognize, is that different generations, depending on which generation you're from, handle things differently. But before we dig into that, I want you to read this and take, pay careful attention to this. Marketing support is no longer just some brochures and a website. That's going to be the general theme throughout these next couple slides. Keep this in mind. and Keep this in mind in the context of generations. So let's pretend that you're a baby boomer. Baby boomers typically are very comfortable working on a computer, sending an email, talking on the phone. They like to talk on the phone. Faxes works for them. This is different from the next group, the Gen Xers. The Gen Xers are a little bit more comfortable sending texts. They would rather sit in a cubicle next to you or down the road in the office and send you an email instead of coming talk to you face to face. Baby boomers are very good at face to face. Xers are like, you know what, get it out of here, boom, next. The next generation, this Y group, this, this Y group, and, and you'll appreciate this picture, um, they're a little bit different. Their expectations are different, and the reason is because they're the first generation that grew up with technology surrounding them. It's part of them. They didn't know a time of a rotary phone. They didn't know when there was a black and white television. They never saw a typewriter. They've always had computers. They've always worked this way. I went to a Catholic school. The nuns used to chase me, and they'd say, okay, you, I got caught with a note passing it from Nancy to Mary. I, they didn't have notes because they had a cell phone. So they can stand there and multitask and talk to you, look you right in the eye, and text. That's how they grew up. They're hardwired that way. And they're not even as hardwired as what's, oh, baby boomer, I'm sorry. The Gen Y people turn baby boomers on their heads, drive them crazy. It's difficult for them to get along. So where are the reps at and what age group are there and how they're communicating with you? Their expectation is going to be different. And you better get used to the Gen Y people because the Gen, a, um, the, Gen Z people are coming next. 
And the Gen Z kids, if you think they surrounded in Gen Ys, they've actually done brain scans of the Gen Z kids. They're hardwired. This is embedded. They're different. They think differently. They have wiring that none of the previous generations have. Their synapses connect differently, and they're going to hit the labor force. Then you're really going to go nuts, all the previous generations, because they're going to get stuff that you can't even connect. You don't have that brain function. So when you see things like, how was your day, sweetie, in school, and it says, read about it on my blog, dad, expect more of that. They're technologically savvy, and there's going to be more and more of that. And that's very, very important in the context of a couple other issues. So hold that thought on that, and let's look at then and now. Back then, I used a typewriter. Then, I, I moved to a laptop. That's now. As we move forward, what we're seeing is we're transitioning from a laptop to mobile. And that can be iPads, Samsung Galaxy, Android-based platforms, or mobile phones. But in conjunction with this transition over to mobile technology and how we access data, we've got to remember the difference between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. Web 1.0 is looking at a billboard. Web 2.0 is where you talk to the billboard and the billboard talks back to you. And how that's happening and evolving is together. So how people are communicating with the hardware technologies and the software combined is pushing each other up. They happen at the same time, they're evolving at rapid pace, and they feed off of each other. So people are accessing this Web 2.0 data, this interactive data, through mobile technology. So which is better, one or two? We've all been to the, well, I trust everybody's been to the eye doctor at some point. So you look through the things, which is better, one or two. So let's pretend you had to install some blinds. How do you want to do it? How are you going to find out about it? Do you want to, one, read through the manual and the book, which is lots of fun, or do you want to pull it up on YouTube and watch the video? On your mobile device where you can stop it, you can pause it, you can restart it, and you can make sure every operation is done. And everybody agrees, I'm going to look at a three-minute video on YouTube to do this before I'm going to read this dang manual. More importantly on that, you can see how people rate it. This is a good video, this is not a good video. You can see how many views of that there were. This is great information to have out there for technical stuff. The people that are selling it want three minutes of time in the field, on the shop floor, wherever your sales force is at, to pull it up on their iPad and show your stuff. This is marketing materials. If your competitors have it, if all the other product lines the rep has has it, and you don't, are you ready for prime time? Are you ready for that level of rep? So let's bring a couple of these things together. And we're all aware of the sales funnel. So it starts with needs awareness, research, how do you compare things and where procurement happens because that's the output you want. You take a whole bunch of stuff at the top and it comes out the bottom and you're generating money. How do people find things? Well, according to global, a global spec study which does industrial studies, most people in the research phase are using search engines. And where are they going? They're going to find this stuff electronically and this could be through those devices. Who's doing it? Gen Ys. Certainly senior managers aren't going to be searching for product. That's not their job. Who gets to do the grunt work? The new guys, the young engineers, the, the people that are new to the company. You're going to prove yourself. You're going to earn your stripes. You do the research. So your stuff has to be out there so you get found so the rep even knows to talk to them. Because you do want the inbound calls. You do want to supply the rep leads. You got to get found. If the rep comes in and he's got Gen Y people in there and they're saying, well, let's find out where this product is and you ain't got no presence, then that young rep who he's relying on because he understands his audience in Gen Y too, that's who he sells to, if he ain't fine, he's looking at his boss and saying, I know it's your rep agency, but these guys ain't got crap. There's nothing here. So remember the one, two? If you don't have the videos out there, if, you can't, if they can't find it in Gen Y, Again, would you rather look at that video or do you want to read a manual? Do you want to read a website? Do you want to look at a catalog? Now I'm going to source it at the research phase up here. I'm going to watch a video and then I'm going to select who to get in touch with. The reps are going to be looking at that. This is going to be a big deal. Because again, the kids that are coming up are growing up before practically they can speak, touching pictures on an iPad. 
Next generation is going to be tougher. The expectation is going to be there. Everything's going to be immediate. They want information. I want it now. How do I find it? Let's look at that mobile technology if you're not aware of where it grows. It's growing, and we're going to concentrate on the U.S. portion here. What we're seeing, and again, this is, this is data from 2011, so it's dated. Pretend all the numbers on these charts have gone up because it's that fast moving. More consumers in key global markets have internet capable mobile devices than computers. That's from January of this year. Mobile phones have overtaken PCs. This is how data is getting accessed. What we're seeing is that smartphone usage has increased and gone up 38%, while at the same time feature phones have gone down. And that trend line is going to keep going. More people are going to access stuff through mobile. So you've got to be mobile friendly with your information. And again, when we come into the industrial sector, we're seeing that smartphone, internet enabled phones are at 54%. So remember we talked about the engineers, customer support, field support, and there's some policies out there. You can't be on Facebook, you can't be on YouTube, you don't have access to this, it's blocked by a firewall, my people don't need it. If your customers are accessing it, if your guy on the road or your woman on the road who's that sales rep at 7 o'clock at night their time is driving down the road trying to talk on the phone saying pull up this video or pull this up and it's not enabled, you're useless to that rep. You don't have access. You might as well speak a different language. So this all goes into that mix of why a rep is going to work with you and be successful or not be successful in today's environment. You've got to make it friendly to do business with. Let's look at some stats just on Twitter, because Twitter's fun, everybody's heard of it. Uh, I was first told a couple years ago Twitter's like snack food. It's fun to digest, but it has no nutritional value. It's now got nutritional value, and here's where. So let's look at some statistics on adoption rates, specifically on Twitter. Um, back in 62, there was a study called Diffusion of Innovations that identified when technology comes on board, when it's adopted, when it goes mainstream. And the key point was about 30% of the population is using it. So if 30% of the population using it, it becomes mainstream. It took television a long time to get there, about 30 years. It took phones a long time to get there. It's, it's tightened up to about 10 years with newer technology, and now it's down to about three to four years once it goes mainstream. And this is all identified, the, the crux point, the key point here is when it crosses the chasm. And this was defined in a 90, 1991 book called Crossing the Chasm. So it's the midpoint of the early adopters. When does it go mainstream? So what we really want to know in a, in a social media platform like Twitter, so this is where the Gen Ys are looking again, this is where the stuff is getting found, this is somewhere the research is done, has it crossed the chasm in the industrial sector? There's not a lot of great analytics out there, but we do have some analytics that are going to be useful. So we, I took a look at the Pew Internet study over a three-year period, 2010, 2011, 2012, and overlaid that with Global Spec. Again, does analysis for the industrial sector, same years. And what we find out is the adoption rate, we've crossed the chasm over 15% at Pew in the general population of the United States. It's going to vary a little bit. And we certainly crossed the chasm in the manufacturing industrial sector where we're pushing 23% adoption. We've got more adoption, 15% versus 23%, in the industrial sector than we have in the general population. Not a lot of people realize that who are in this business of manufacturing, of the industrial space. Twitter's a big deal. Your people are finding stuff out there. The reps can take advantage of this. This is a source to get them leads. You need to be in this space because that's one of the things they're going to start to look at very closely. Remember, either way you slice it, it's already crossed the chasm. So the adoption rates are there. This, this technology isn't going away. We've drilled down into one piece of social media, but it's just to prove the point that if you want to get on target with this stuff, it's with that rifle shot target of where your customers are at to help your reps in given markets, this is the kind of things they're going to start to ask you questions about. It's already happening. So how do you find a rep? Well, 
There's a couple spaces out there where you can get it in, and find a rep traditional sources like MANA, the Manufacturers Agents National Association. They have territory maps, they have contracts, they have a ton of information for you regardless of which industry segment you're in. Very reliable company. I was a member both as a manufacturer and as a rep. Great organization. Then there's some other stuff. So Rep Locate has a service called Rep Hunter where you can come in and you can find reps within your relevant area and what to do. These are good sources. You got to pay for them. Um, you can also find, depending on which industry you're in, for example, the Industrial Supply Association has a whole rep group within the Industrial Supply Association, a subgroup that you can find reps within that industry sector. Electronics industry, all these different industries have organizations within them. It takes a little bit of mining to find all this stuff. And the key question through all of them is when you first talk to somebody and you call them up as a rep, they don't know you and you don't know them. So you're at a trust level of zero. You have to develop rapport. How are you gonna check them out? It's like anything else. You call up your friend and you say, tell me about this company. Tell me about this person. So I'm not saying that these aren't good sources for things, but you want to find out how you're connected to them. People do business with people. People relate to people. So it's about personal connections and how you find things. If you do business with people that you know, the best way to find people you know is through your other connections. So there's this product called LinkedIn. Hopefully most of you, all of you should have a LinkedIn profile and a company page and a myriad of other things you should be doing on LinkedIn and how to complete that. We don't have time to cover it, but this is a wonderful tool to find reps, get references from your customers. Who's good? And it's based upon a real simple concept called six degrees, degrees of separation. So you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that finally knows somebody else that puts you in contact with the person that you want to be in touch with. And there's somebody else that they know that you might not know that has acted with Kevin Bacon. LinkedIn is a great way to connect with people. You can get the references. You can get to know who everybody is. Who you know gets you in the door. What you know keeps you there. Great saying, been around for a long time, you got to know the right people. You got to leverage your connections that are there. Ask for, from your end users, from your channel partners, who's a good rep? Ask other rep agencies. Best way to do it is say, hey, you're also connected to this person. If you haven't updated your LinkedIn profile and you don't have any connections, you're not going to have those references. People do business with people. Key takeaways here. Talk to who you know already. First thing, before you start paying for service, find out who you know, find out what their take is on stuff. Listen to the real questions once you start talking to the reps. Remember, the reps are the field guys, and I can't illustrate it better than this image right here. Here, the, the Marine Corps has a philosophy, and the Marine Corps are the kind of first people in. A second lieutenant Marine can look at this thing and say, I need an airstrike here, I need artillery here. There could be a general watching from the drone back at the Pentagon and said, you know, I think maybe they don't do that. Why? I mean, they can, they can override them. This is the guy on the firing line. This is the woman on the firing line. They know what's happening, they know what they need if they've trained them well enough. So if you train your reps and they put the stuff out there and they're working in your best interest and you trust them and they trust you, well, this, is a, this is a pretty big example, you know, lives are at stake, but the reality is their business life is at stake, their reputation is at stake. They have to live in that market. Trust them. Listen to what they say. If they tell you enough times that they need something, take that as feedback, fix it so it doesn't happen again. Listen to the real questions, even after you have them. Be easy to do business with. Don't make it difficult. So when they call up on the phone, take their call. The guy's driving down the road, the woman's driving down the road, been here, Woodstock on stereo, can't see in front of you, got you on speakerphone because the snow's blinding you down, and you got a bad connection, and you put me on hold. 
and I'm going to lose the call. And you're going to close, and I have to see the customer at 6 o'clock the next morning. Answer the question, have the people qualified, have it easy to do business, appreciate that they're not going home at 5 o'clock. They may not even get into a motel room till 1 o'clock in the morning for the 6 o'clock meeting. Respect their time. Trust. So, part of customer service involves courteousness, professionalism, efficiency. These are all things you should know. Keep them all in mind, everything that goes into them. You've got to earn their time. An independent agent has a couple different product lines. So this, this falls into everything we talked about on how much commission you pay, how difficult you are to deal with, how easy you are to deal with. If you're easy to sell and I make a lot of money, and I wake up in the morning and say, I gotta do something. These guys don't return my calls, they don't do my quotes, they're late on deliveries, they don't supply this screw that this competitor does. These guys call me back, they pay me on time, it's direct deposit, they get me answers, they text me the stuff and they send the stuff to my customers right when they say it and they answer the phone call in two rings. Who do I want to work with? Oh, and they pay me more. Which company am I going to work for that day? Which one am I more comfortable with? You want to make yours the most fun, easiest company to deal with because they're also your customer. You're buying their time. Yeah, you're paying them, but they could talk about you or they could talk about somebody else. Make sure they're talking about you. Remember, time is money. Bottom line, build a reputation in the marketplace that's trusted. Because remember how the, I said the reps are going to call up their buddies and say, tell me about this guy and if they pay, tell me about this company. Do they pay on time? How are they with this? <sighs> you don't want to deal with them. You don't want that reputation. You need to build a reputation that's solid and trusted. And those companies get the premier reps. Rep, good reps don't want lines. It's either not going to fit, they got their market down, they're not looking. People are looking for them because they're that good. You got to have a reputation to be entrusted. So they come to you and say, you know what, I want to play for your team. I'm the top guy in the field in my market. I want to play on your team. That's the people you want. You can't approach this, I can't emphasize enough, that if you approach this, we are both holding dynamite and bombs behind each other's back, waiting to kill each other, and you don't trust each other, it's not going to work. You got to start off with trust. So I recently returned from the International Manufacturing Technology Show in Chicago, in McCormick Place. This is a picture of the Grand Concourse, the main reception area. And they had a bunch of good advice hanging on the banners. You'll notice this one right here. What I want to show you is be engaged. Be engaged with your customers, be engaged with the reps, be engaged with your, with your team. Listen to the feedback, give it back to the reps when you're talking to them. The more engaged you are, it's going to come through. Be engaged in how your marketing materials happen if you're using social media. I'm going to turn you over now to your facilitator for this. If you need to reach me, here's my contact information. You can scan this QR code, dial me up on my cell phone, it rings right through. All my contact information. Thanks for coming.